not a problem. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, folks. Lost yeah. the stream there for a second. Let me get this back up here. This is why I've employed my employed my son to um, tech support. Yep. Because I got one of those too. Idea. <laughs> yep. Well, it's good for him to. He likes to play around on this stuff, and so it's uh, it's a, a situation where, all right, if you want to play around on this stuff, then um, you can you can help me. <laughs> it's good for him, um, and I pay him so. That, that's good. Okay, so um, we were... Where were we here? Uh, um, you're talking about the law by any other name is still what God demands of us. Right, right. The law, the law becomes a comfort dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hate that. I, I hate just, that. Yeah, so re read that and we'll talk about it. Yeah, so so let me just reread this paragraph in case it didn't get, get in on the... When the we lost the live stream there. Um but the law by any other name is still what God demands of us. It makes no difference whether we tell our people Christians must do or Christians should do or Christians ought to do or Christians do or will do good works. The law by any other name is just as burdensome as and as helpful. Its burden falls on us and negative judgments from God's plan regarding our intentions or our actions can be as instructive as the positive admonitions of Paul or Moses. As James Nestikin has observed, you can tame the wolf into a valuable guide dog, but you never know when it's going to turn on you. Um, yeah, the, the law, he goes on to say, the law becomes a comfort dog, though only for a time. For those in our society who have experienced such chaos in their young lives that some semblance of order which, can, which clear imper imperatives can produce is truly good news. The comfort they find from imperatives setting things in order turns into a crushing burden when they find his law does not, and certainly not our performance of it, truly comfort and support. Only the person of our God provides ultimate comfort. Preachers must, and this is a burden which imposes pressure, listen carefully and develop sensitivity to how the law is making an impact on individual hearers. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> let, me jump, let me jump in here right away. Okay. Let's deal with that nesting in quote. You can tame yep. the wolf to a valuable guide dog, but you never know where when it is going to turn on you. Right. First of all, it's not our law. It's God's law. And as Kolb goes on to say later on in his article, um, he says, uh, da, 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 da. The Jesus imperatives are more comprehensive than what was said of old. Some are startling, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, but they are understood only if taken as Jesus does with the understanding of the loving father who stands behind the imperatives. So that right there is critical to everything that is being said here. And let me say this, Dr. Kolb, I don't think he's like an all out radical Lutheran, which no. as people know, when I'm on Twitter, I'm getting a little bit more extreme and I'm just like hashtag fake Lutheranism, you know, <laughs> right. but really, mm -hmm. and, and he's, I don't associate Dr. Kolb with that hashtag. But he's got a lot of friends because Dr. Kolb is a really wonderful, gracious man who will just do anything for anybody. Mm -hmm. And where other people who I have talked to in the orbit of radical Lutheranism, basically, you know, at some point they're just like, Nate blocked, Nate yep. blocked. you know, it's like, and I'm not going after anybody personally. I'm not calling them names. I'm just simply, you know, being persistent. Okay. I'm annoying fine you mm -hmm. find me annoying a lot of people don't you know you do uh, <laughs> yeah but but dr kolb isn't like that right. and dr kolb will listen dr kolb will keep on engaging and he'll keep on going on but mm -hmm. like see the radical lutherans what they do is basically with them the law of god and the will of god become two different things right and spirit the holy spirit doesn't really deliver the law of god and use the law of God to kill us. I mean, that's just, we don't really associate that so much with the Holy Spirit. 
at least this is what Nicholas Hopman does and Steve Paulson, I believe, too. Right. But what's more happening is like the gospel is associated with the Holy Spirit. The gospel is associated with the truth. And this goes so far like Werner Ehlert, who a man named Edward Schroeder, uh, he built on. Uh, Edward Schroeder was one of the guys behind the gospel reductionism in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in the 1970s. Mm. He really liked Werner Ehlert for some reason, who a lot of conservatives seem to think was a pretty good guy, pretty solid. But mm. Werner Ehlert, if you look at the notes that Schroeder has from, uh, from Ehlert's lectures, talks about how Ehlert said, and I believe you can also find this in his work, so it's not so obvious. Um, he basically said that the gospel was the clear word of God. The gospel was the perspicuous word of scripture, mm-hmm. not, the lo- not, not really the law. Okay. And that just brings me to one more thing I just want to say, and then I'll let you jump in here. Sure. Um, and that has to do <clears throat> with what Stephen Paulson has said in one of his recent, um, in one of his recent articles from, did I bring the book outside here? Oh, I forgot to bring it outside. I was going to show everybody. Um, it's called God's Two Words. It came out from Erd's, Erdman's uh, a few years ago. But he basically said, uh, I have to find this quote about um, what the law does. Um, here, you go on and yeah. talk for a while. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Find the, I'll find the quote. Okay. Uh, and, uh, share that in a yeah. minute. Well, the problem, again, I have with, um, with this quote. You can tame the wolf into a valuable guide dog, but you never know when it's going to turn on you. Okay, that statement necessarily excludes third use of the law. Has to. Because as a Christian, the law never exclusively turns on us as purely second use. It, It cannot. If we're Christians, we're always going to want that we're going to embrace that instruction in the law it's not going to turn on us and overcome us i know maybe what he's talking about maybe you fall into some manifest sin you know you know a man goes out and commits adultery on his wife okay that you know that law of him you know providing for his family taking care of his wife that all kind of starts crumbling down and he becomes convicted uh, of the sin i get that but if he's still a christian he will want to do the good works of, of repentance the only time that that quote guide dog but turns back completely into a wolf is if you lose faith can, uh, can i can yeah, jump in here? yeah um i would i would maybe disagree okay he also also turns into a wolf when satan is the one wielding the law okay okay and this is the thing i think this when i was saying that hopman associates the work of the holy spirit with the gospel and not with the law that's because satan is the one who is kind of using the law and God's, I guess, letting Satan use the law. And then in the big perspective, of course, you know, this is all in God's plan. So you could say it's kind of God using the law indirectly through Satan. See, this is kind of the stuff that's going on here. Now, I found, uh, I can't find the, the Paulson quote entirely, but I will say this. It basically says this. God's law removes faith in God's word. Wow. Yes. That's God's bold. law. God's law removes faith in god's word well so are we completely associating the holy spirit with the gospel only and like what is going what is going on with that quote right what is going on with that quote and of course we also and that same article let me just also share just one other uh quote that paulson has in there he says that um uh he says he goes so far to say it's simply not possible for for uh, Christians to sin in a way because the eternal law of God is now, in a sense, really and truly behind them. Okay? Um, so now he didn't, that's, actually that's that's not an exact quote, but if you look in the article, he has this whole idea of the law of God being behind us, the eternal law of God is behind us, and we're now living in the new age of, you know, where the law passes away. The new creation comes. The gospel comes. 
And we are now, as I think Paulson says in his 2011 book, where he also, by the way, says Christ committed his own personal sin. Mm -hmm. um, he says that, you know, we're, we're, we're free. We, we have no law, you know, and we're, we're free. We're free now. And, and it's like, and this is just the existentialist, existential kind of way that he's dealing with it. And it's like, and we all know that that's not real freedom. Right. I mean, real freedom has people in your lives who are with you and are standing by your side, not just to forgive you, mm -hmm. but to love you in hard ways too. Yeah. You know, yeah, right. That's, so that's like, right. Yeah. And, and it's like, but it's, but it's so hard because I will listen to all of uh, the outlaw God podcasts, by the way, I do that for you and everybody <laughs> else. No. I appreciate um, that. It, and, and, you know, and so often like what, what Dr. Paulson says, um, you know, sounds, sounds very good. Mm -hmm. And I, and I can understand it in an orthodox way. Right. But I'm wondering like, but, but what is, but, but, but where is this coming from? Because I also hear you say things that are completely off the reservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the law of God removes faith. Right. Right. Yeah. I, that's, that's what is good. That should be a red flag there. It's like, what is going on? And yeah. it's like, and I think I do kind of have a sense of what's going on to some degree mm -hmm. because of the reading, you know, I've read a lot of Paulson stuff. I've listened to him a lot, but right. again, I, well, I mean, for me, as you know, I made a big stink about it on the internet about mm -hmm. this whole Christ committed his own personal sin. It's like, if that's just not disqualifying right away, right. What is, yeah. what, well, what is with, Lutheran? you know, Lutherans that were so gracious. Um, and, and I mean, I, and honestly, I don't, you know, I don't have any desire to go after Stephen Paulson. I, I actually listen to him and, you know, and I, and I confess, I confess, I find myself drawn to his personality, his humor, his knowledge, uh, you know, he, in, in that sense, he's a very attractive figure to me. Right. And, uh, you know, he doesn't feel the same way about me, but, uh, you know, but it's like, we have to challenge each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what love does. I mean, love points out that you're, you're off the reservation, man. Right. Come on. Well, so. And, and so, and again, post postmodern ethos are, I'm convinced are, I mean, I catch myself doing this all the time. These are the waters in which we swim. So he'll say something like, um, the law, what did you say? The law decreases faith or hurts faith or what? what is but the it? Law, the law removes faith. The law removes faith. Okay. In God, the law removes faith in God's word. Right. So when you call... I, mean, I could understand. I could understand if it was removing bad faith. Right. Perhaps, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. Faith, idolatrous belief. Yeah. Unbelief. Right. But or no, we're talking about removes faith in God's word. And for him, I guess... Like Alert, mm -hmm. God's word is only ultimately the gospel. Right. It's yeah. It's it's a gospel. Well, you would think it's a gospel rejectionist statement. So, but then you put something like this podcast out, or you say something on Twitter about that, and then all the minions of fifteen seventeen and higher things and Christ hold fast descend on you and say, "Oh, that's not what Doctor Paulson really meant. What he really means is some blah 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 gobbledygook." Like, um, and, and the only the only in my simple black and white mind the only category i can put that in is um oh when we mean when we say defund the police we really don't mean defund the police what we mean is da 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 well then don't say defund the police if you don't mean that god's law takes away faith i guess to paraphrase what you're saying then don't say that if you or don't Christ committed if, his own personal sin right if you don't mean that don't say it because we speak english here in the real world and when you put crap like that out, that's how I'm going to receive it. And and here's the here's in in a broad sense, and I I can only speculate on this. Fifteen seventeen higher things. Christ will fast. Those organizations are extremely popular, and the reason they're popular is because they're attractive to people who aren't who aren't being uh, granted faith and repentance. They're they're attractive to people who want to somehow give themselves the placebo to think that they're involved in Christianity. Um, and yeah, and then maybe they can show up to church once a month if they feel like it, or crack open their Bible a couple times a year if they feel like it. You know, <laughs> Chris, Chris, when you become a Christian, when you become a child of the Most High God of the universe through the grace of Jesus Christ, there are 
ex expectations placed on you. There are rules, and they are not clear about that, and they have their big smoke and lights, you know, rock fest shows, and they have guys like Paulson get up there and talk about how Christianity doesn't have anything to do with following the rules, and then he'll, and then when you call him out on that, he'll say, oh, you're just, you're just a hater, or, you know, I didn't really mean it that way, or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, that's what attracts these people. That's why the, you know, that's why, you know, we don't have 5,000, 10,000 people showing up at Redeemer Church or your church is because this is where the, this is where the genuine Christians are. And not all of them, I don't know if everybody in Redeemer is, but this is what attracts real Christians. <laughs> um, you know, that, you see, that's the thing is I've always been, well, even when I was a, a pop evangelical, I was always suspect of what was popular, what, you know, all, you know, you're getting all these people in and, um, you know, th that was, that was one big harangue I had with, with, uh, with pastors that I worked under was we're getting all these people in. I'm going to start saying things that, you know, is going to start to separate the wheat from the chaff. And I got in a lot of hot water because we're supposed to be seeker sensitive. I wasn't being seeker sensitive when I talked like that, you see. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I am very suspect, and I think for good reason, uh, of, of things, particularly that are Lutheran, that seem to be popular, that seem to be the thing everybody flocks to. You know, what, what, you know that, I don't think that you can always just you know, right away make that litmus test, but if you're popular, then I'm suspect of what you're doing. So, so if you're popular, then I'm going to listen to you and see what you're saying. And if what you're saying is like, oh yeah, I can see why you're popular because you're saying you're, it, you're, you're scratching itching ears. That's what you're doing. That's why you're popular. Um, you know, and that, I, you know, uh, I, this is why I'm glad I meet with you on these things because, you know, I, this is, this is just what's, the, what's going through my mind is this is, this is, you know, St. Paul warned of this. There will come along teachers who will who will preach in ways that people want to hear. You tell people what they want to hear, and you're going to be popular. Go ahead. I just want to say, like, when Kolb says that um, it makes no difference whether we tell our people Christians must do, Christians should do, Christians ought to do, or Christians do or will do good works, I want to say there, um, it does make a difference. Now, the, the, sometimes it, some, sometimes it might not make a difference. You have somebody who has a genuinely terrified conscience, mm -hmm. who is fearful of right. God's judgment. Right. And you just, if, you know, you're just explaining to them that Christians will, will do or Christians do good works. I mean, yeah, this is why Lutheran said we shouldn't say good works are necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. We should just say good works are necessary. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why Lutherans made that distinction. Right. So, I mean, it does make a difference, though, like the words here because there are different contexts where you don't have a person who's necessarily in great fear of god you know and just right. talking to you about like i don't know what's going to happen to me when i die it's like you know you're just talking to a christian it's yep. like yeah you can talk about how christians do good works or will do good works and you can even command them <laughs> I mean, right. it's like this is the thing because uh you know you look at the way that Paul wields the law, you know, and sometimes, uh, well, we know in first John, it says that God's commands are not burdensome. What is that all about? Mm -hmm. And we know that, uh, Paul, Paul even says at one point in one of his letters, you know, I don't say this to condemn you. You know, it's like <laughs> Paul is trying to instruct and guide and command. And Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right. So that means that we should be doing that kind of thing too, as a regular course yep. of events this should be and a, that yeah this should be a, yeah go ahead sorry but people i mean th i think people are afraid we're going to become fundamentalists and you know we're going to become very legalistic yeah. and you know but and, and it just totally goes against the grain of our culture and i i just want to repeat again yes yep. you do need to be like Kolb says here he says that um uh Right here, we need to listen carefully and develop sensitivity to how the law is making an impact on individual hearers. He sure. is exactly That's right true. about that. But yeah. I guess I would come back and say, like, I, I don't think I don't think we're doing it well enough. No, I mean, <laughs> well, and that's that's the thing. Again, going back to, you know, my original premise of this whole thing is that, you know, instruction in the law should be thematic of your preaching and teaching. And you you cannot find that in preaching and teaching from these organizations. You can't find it. Forget about right. it, get, getting a mention here or there, or maybe Scott Keith mentioned a couple of good things in his book, you know, whatever. How, 
That's yeah. not what I, I, I'm talking about. This is stuff that you should be talking about each and every time. Now, I get the I, the danger. Again, we got we've got to guard our, guard ourselves from becoming legalistic Pharisees. I get that. That we have to watch that. We have to we have to look out for that sort of thing. Um, but that does not mean that you exclude this type of teaching um, from your from your curriculum when you're putting it out there from from your uh, you know from your repertoire of what it is you're going to teach from God's word. You know, we're, we're so scared of being legalists that you know we're going to make a law that we don't teach about the law <laughs> type of thing. Um, you know, and then and then on top of and that, that becomes a, that becomes kind of legalistic too. In yeah, a way. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, so if yeah. if I were to write an article, uh, you know, I've I've had fairly good amount of success being published and that sort of thing, and you know, what sure. why what you know, and you know, CPH even signed me on to to write uh, next year's December portals of prayers. Did I tell you about that? Yeah. Awesome. So, so anyway, um. But if, if I, I would never get an article published at 1517. Why? Because I would talk like that. Uh, they have a law there. We don't, we don't publish articles like this because we don't emphasize, we don't emphasize that part uh, of the Bible. Well, no, not only do you not emphasize, you don't talk about it. You never talk about it. The other issue I have with this is the times when I've been most terrified and convicted in my heart is when my brothers and my pastor call me out on specific sins I'm struggling with that. And, and and the reality of me not obeying those in my real life, um, is what brings me to the gospel. See? So when you don't instruct in the law properly, you really knock the sharp edge off the second use in my opinion. Uh, because you know, if, if you're, if you're, um, if you're discovered in a secret sin and one of your brothers points it out, and you're a Christian, that's going to cut you to the heart and, and cause you to repent. Uh, but if you're not really too much, too worried about obedience, y'all, you, we're not worried about obedience, you know, conforming ourselves to the commands of Holy Scripture. Well, you're just going to blow that off and say, well, God forgives me in the gospel and that. You, you're going to fall into that trap, into that, you know, well, I'm committing this habitual sin, but God forgives me, so I'm not I'm not going to worry about it too much. You know, the, the most the most convicting law preaching is instruction in the law a lot of times. Because it hits you and you say, oh, I'm, I'm doing that sin and I know it and I need to change. I need to <laughs> promise to do better as, as the catechism teaches us in confession. All right. Uh, that, that, that word is taboo at 1517. Get better. Do better. Be a better man. You know, <laughs> that, that, right. Well, yeah. And I, and I told you, I, I told you the funny thing that I was at a Bible study with a conservative confessional Lutheran pastor. He had a group of 15 guys there. Yep. Uh, it was most of the content was stellar, you know, and, and then like at one point he said that I know that, you know, when I have a parishioner who tells me that they're trying to be a better dad, he's like, I know I'm dealing with with legalism. Ah. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, here, then let's 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 hear from another legalist named Martin Luther. Yeah, uh, it, this is so <laughs> funny because like Matthew, this last week, last couple of weeks on Twitter, I've been putting up that proverb. Um Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Yep. And that is exactly what you just described. You just 100%. described how your brothers, when your brothers confront you, when people who you know love you, love Jesus, love the the Christian faith, you know, when they confront you, I mean, that's exactly what you need. You know it. You don't necessarily want it at the time, but yep. you are a new man. Yep. And so you're like, man. I should be loving that. I should be loving that rebuke. I should be loving the commands. Well, <laughs> and I'm not. Well, that's and that's the thing is, <laughs> but, but it, God, you're right. You're right. Forgive me. Yeah, it's it. Well, and, and the thing of it is, is it's it hurts at the time. It really does, and, and it terrifies you. And uh, but, we, you know, once you kind of get some distance from that sort of thing, I mean, you know, the the guys I'm close friends with up here are, you know, they're they're real good at. We're very good at calling each other out on stuff, you know, and and, you know, and presenting the gospel of course in, in that context but uh but it hurts at the time for a good friend to confront you on something uh but if you ha- but by the grace of god and and the power of the holy spirit you you receive that you say yep you know what you're right i this is something i need to correct um and then you get some distance from that and you look back on it and you say i'm so glad my brother said that to me man i you know because i because 
you know, I was just kind of muddling around with trying to get over this sin. You know, I was just kind of, eh, I'm playing with it, uh, you know, toy with it. Maybe I'll think about not doing it today, but, you know, if I fall into it tomorrow, no big deal. You know, no. Uh, once that brother confronts you, then you're like, okay, that 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 is helpful. You know, and you embrace that sort of thing. Um but you know, but again, you're not you're not gonna you're not gonna catch uh, the language uh, that kind of language being spoken here. Go ahead with your with your quote yes, from Luther. This is, this is Luther uh, Church and Ministry Three, Volume Forty One of Luther's Works, Page One Sixty Five. He's talking about the marks of the church. He says, "The true seven principal parts of the great holy possession, whereby the Holy Spirit affects us, uh, sorry, affects in us a daily sanctification and vivification in Christ, according to the first table of Moses." By, by this we obey it, albeit never as perfectly as Christ, but we constantly strive to attain the goal under his redemption or remission of sin until we too shall one day become perfectly holy and no longer stand in need of forgiveness. Everything is directed toward that goal. Mm -hmm. Now, he goes on to say down here at the end, or he goes on a few paragraphs later, <clears throat> he says, uh, truthful, trustworthy, and do whatever else is taught in these commandments, all of which St. Paul teaches us abundantly in more than one place. We need the Decalogue not only to apprise us of our lawful obligations, but we also need it to discern how far the Holy Spirit has advanced us in his work of sanctification and by how much we still fall short of the goal, lest we become secure and imagine that we have now done all that is required. Thus, we must constantly grow in sanctification and always become new creatures in Christ. This means grow and do so more and more. Yep. Legalist. <laughs> hey, so, um. Can, so come on, come yeah. on, 1517. Give me the true Luther, huh? Right, please. Um, I mean, come on. This is so <laughs> stupid. And it, yeah. like, I'm sorry. Now I'm feeling frustrated. It's like. What, are you telling me that I can't understand those words? Are you right. going to give me some nonsense about how words change? Or I like that's what the world does, right? Right. That's what the world does. Yep. The world says it's all about rhetoric. The world says truth doesn't matter. The world says everything is about power. Right. We aren't like that. We are Christians. Yep, hundred so percent. What the hell is going on, jagged word? Yeah, exactly. As you said in your meme, which I read, and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> right. That's some that's, good. Ad that's some good advertising, man. Well, that's that's yeah. That, yeah. What the hell is going on? Yeah, the yeah. Um, I, Isaac didn't put that in there. He um, that's that's the that's the punchline for I, jagged word I no know. i know it's their tagline isn't so, it ironic it, isn't it isn't it ironic uh-huh hey um i'm gonna take a two-minute coffee break i'm gonna grab a coffee is that cool all right and uh if you want to grab a coffee and we'll come back and we'll we'll finish this out all right we we've, we've got how much time do we have left here about a half oh, hour yeah. so yeah yeah sounds good okay sounds good all right wait, wait for us if you're watching online yep <laughs> see you in a second folks we'll be right back
Okay, we're back. Nathan's going to read me a quote here. What was that? I said, you're going to read me a quote. Yeah, you know, this just goes to show that, like, how... Let's take our country, for example, and the context that we have. And we live in America. Everybody likes freedom. We've got liberals and conservatives. But, you know, even conservatives are going to agree with this paragraph here from Rusty Reno's book. Rusty Reno's editor of First Things. This is The Return of the Strong Gods. He says... He's just talking about government in general. He says, if we vest our government with the power to organize society, we alienate our freedom to someone above us. There is great potential for abuse in this relationship, to say the least. And Milton Friedman makes the common sense observation that coordination without coercion, coordination without coercion is preferable to principles of social organization that require coercion. As Henry David Thoreau observed, the best government is that which governs least. Aristotle, Aristotle held a similar view, though he drew conclusions quite different from those of freedmen in the classical liberal traditions. Aristotle saw that a free society requires well-trained citizens that are habituated to seek what is just. The more virtuous the populace, the less coercion will be needed. Well, the reason I want to read that is just because like um, Lutheran theology is, is all concerned about coercion today. Mm. And, and there's a good reason for that. And that's because... Uh, you know, the desire for freedom um, and liberty and to not be under someone's thumb is a pretty universal thing in human history. But we know that throughout human history, <clears throat> only a, a place like America, for example, only really came about, you know, just what, 200, 250 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, we're kind of we're kind of unique. Uh, but even us classical liberal, I mean, conservatives were like classical liberals i mean because mm -hmm. that's the way we all think mm -hmm. and we just don't like the idea of government in general government mm -hmm. in the church doesn't sound like a good thing for us right <laughs> but but the church does need the church does have a government mm -hmm. and just like your family is a mini government right and you and you tell your kids what to do you guide them mm -hmm. you instruct them you love them that's what the church is supposed to be like Right. And that is kind of what, yeah, I guess our leaders are supposed to be like, too, to a degree. It's like, yes, you do want to allow freedom as much as possible. I'm like that, too. I don't really want to go tell everybody what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I got my own problems. I right. got my own family. Right. Right. But, but we got to take this stuff into account and just realize the context that we are in. Right. And that context, it just affects everything. I mean, yeah. that's just the way that people in academia think, the way our elites think. Everybody wants i mean but of course as we know that coercion is coming back isn't it yeah. because people all because people also see that as desirable as this is uh, as as much as people want this uh you know we're conflicted human beings and mm -hmm. and we uh we mess everything up and ideas have consequences and unintended consequences and mm -hmm. and so like there's this big war right now um at least of ideas yeah. In a country like ours, like what's going to happen next? Where are yeah. we going? Right. Um, sorry, I'm getting off topic no, a little. No, bit. but no, but it's but it's but it's, it's, along, it's, it's along these lines of, of the law. And, you know, I I, I don't want to be under anybody's thumb but Christ's. That's whose thumb I want to be under. So if you are if you are helping to support what God teaches in his law, then then I'm going to submit to that. If you run counter to that, then we're going to have problems. Um, and the thing, what? <laughs> and you're not saying, and by saying that, you're not saying that you you mean to kind of have a skeptical or cynical attitude towards all authorities, right? I mean, you're just saying that, like, if the proper authorities in the proper offices who are over me, um, especially like my pastor, you know, if, if mm -hmm. they tell me, if they're guiding me, if they're instructing me, I'm going to assume the best. But you know, I also he tells me himself to pay attention to the scripture. He yep. tells me himself to correct him or to like, you know, point out things if something doesn't seem right. Yeah. So it's like, we don't have, we don't start with this default skepticism of authority. And that's like, right. well, at least we shouldn't, we really no. shouldn't. And maybe this is part of my personality coming out, mm -hmm. but you know, it's like, I'll just say, you know, I had a, I had a father who was, a, I think a very good father. Um, yeah, he's a baby boomer, but I think he was a very, <laughs> I think he was a very good father, yeah. you know? And it's mm -hmm. like, and just, obeying my dad was never really a chore for me. Yeah. 
I mean, it really wasn't. Right. I mean, I didn't always like what he had to say, but I always knew my dad, you know, was, was a good father. Sure. And so yeah. it's like this. Yeah. Go well, ahead. and, and the thing, and the thing of it is that, I mean, the commands of Holy scripture leave tons of freedom to, okay, how, how are you going to, how are you going to obey the sixth commandment? You know, there's, I mean, the sky's the limit, obey the sixth commandment, you know, and, any way you, you you can find fit. Paul's going to give you maybe a little bit more detailed instruction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, uh, Jesus might he might you know he might talk about the sixth commandment. Hey, you know, if you lust, you're breaking the sixth commandment. Let's keep that in mind. You know, type of thing. Um, but for the most part, it's very broad. I mean, and that's kind of how our country's founded. We you know, well, not anymore. We've got so many dang rules. It's ridiculous. Um, that they're that they're overly burdensome, and that that gets to be frustrating because yeah, you get so bogged down in that sort of thing. But um, but yeah, there you know, it, so long and and again, I I give enough latitude to a government to say, hey, as long as you're generally speaking following natural law, and this is this is another thing that's taboo at 1517 is is Thomism, which I'm about as close to a Thomist as you can be without being a a Romanist. Um, as long as you're generally following the natural order of things, as long as you're following natural law uh, in, in the making of, of the government and the imposition of the government, I'm fine with that. Um, you know, I'm okay with that. But the minute you start telling me uh, that uh, there's, you know, there's going to be a government crackdown on you because, you know, your son comes to you and tells you he's a girl and you say, no, afraid not. I mean, this is happening in Canada and a little bit in the United States. We just had a Supreme Court case. Where they're trying, you know, that one in Philadelphia, where they're trying to bar that the Catholic uh, foster services from from participating in the foster program and the adoption programs in Philadelphia because they won't they won't foster or adopt kids to same sex couples. Well, thank goodness we won that case narrowly, but you know, it's not long before the government might come along and say, no, you you know, if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to um, violate natural law to do it, and that's where we say no. <laughs> Right. At least. But well, I mean, yeah. and you can understand. I mean, you can understand why so many confessional Lutherans too have like, um, you know, more libertarian leanings, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they, they they see those dangers. Right. And yeah. And I think, yeah, sometimes that kind of how that affects our theology or how that affects how we think about our theology is an interesting question. But right. I mean, but the fact of the matter is, is that you need good leaders. Yep. We're going to give good laws yep. and we're going to make good judgments. Right. Well, um, and that, you know, and then that. And, Right, and that gets into that gets into deeper issues because then the question comes: Well, what's good? Okay, who you know? And Jesus answered this question: Well, there's no one good except God. Okay, that's that's a that's a critical element that's missing in our culture today, yeah. and, and and it's and it's critical to our even our constitution that we were created. The Creator endowed us with these rights, so He is He is the authority. So no one, He's the one who gave us these rights you have no authority to take these rights away our only job is to protect these rights that god that god the creator has given so okay can it can an atheist follow that well yeah insofar as he's willing to say i'm going to pretend there's a god i'm going to yep. behave as if there's a god okay i can I'm take gonna, that i'm going to respect those who believe yep. this exactly I think that it's, it's but, like voltaire yeah but the but the minute you take god out of the equation now who becomes the authority you do now I'm at the tender mercies of you, and you get to decide mm -hmm. how we behave. So anyway, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to um, Kolb finish the get, article? Well, we can finish the article. But what I'm wondering is, I mean, does Kolb get into much else other than this, or is there is there another point you want to well, hit? I, I kind of okay, yeah. Let me let me take a look at it. Okay. Um, it won't take me long here. I've yeah. got some things highlighted. Okay. Uh, Kolb, Kolb talks also about how liberating honesty about our sin and his empowerment comes only through the destruction of our sinful identity through Christ's forgiveness. His death and resurrection provide the only antidote for the plague of our doubt of his word and denial of his lordship. I agree with that. I think that's good. He also talks about how some imperatives function as invitations rather than commands. Um, I think that uh, I, I get what he's saying there. You know, he says, eat up, said to a hungry person does not expect obedience, but an eager response to the gift of food set before her, uh, not grammatical form, but meaning and context is in fact what conveys our message. But I mean, I would, 
I would point out here that um, that there, you know, there are times where it is appropriate. Uh, like, you get the sense from reading Kolb's article that you know he's like saying you can never really command something like faith or trust or hope mm-hmm. or love even. But and I've seen other people, uh, other Lutherans who are maybe friendly with Werner Ehlert and Edward Schroeder, the gospel reductionist guy, I've seen them all say that too. Right. And that's just simply wrong. I yeah. mean, yes, in a sense, uh, when we're talking about justification, you really can't go there because there's nothing that we can do ever. <laughs> I mean, God, God transforms you. God moves you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And if you thought you had a hand in it, uh, maybe wait a few years, you know, and, and look back at it a little bit yeah. more. Um, but when it comes to sanctification, again, no, we can appre- we can learn to appreciate commands. We can accept it. Jesus said mm-hmm. he commanded us to love one another. Mm-hmm. OK, but he does command love. Yeah. And, and like I heard one guy say, oh, it's an oxymoronic statement. Mm-hmm. It's like, no. It's like, actually, as we mature in Christ, Mm -hmm. uh, we do eagerly receive commands more. Right. That's just the way it is. And well, and that's, yeah, uh, that, and that's, again, we're, we're products of our culture and that, that whole idea of, you know, you have to feel it, you know, you have to feel love. No, I mean, I thought we Lutherans were kind of, we kind of poo pooed the feelings. We just, you know, uh, we just believed empirically, you know, we, we are, and I, I, I'm convinced of the see, I, I think ever since Freud, we've kind of been taught in our culture that, that our feelings dictate everything, you know. Um, when, you know, classically speaking, uh, it, it's our cognition that dictates things. I have this feeling, it's wrong. My mind says, that feeling's wrong. And I'm not going to su- succumb to that feeling. Um, and that's, you know, that's another postmodern notion that the feelings, the emotions are elevated above everything, above the intellect and everything. And, right. you know, well, uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I can kind of understand that. I mean, I do think there might even be something to that where, like, we're not as in touch with our desires as we should be. And we don't recognize how like, you know, just those desires are moving the elephant as Jonathan Haidt, the sociologist argues. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think you can kind of see some of that in Luther's bondage of the will as well, but, but you're right. But as we mature, as we mature as Christians, we are to have the mind of Christ. And so we should be able to have a better handle on like, yes, you know, I have an old man and a new man. It's a bit of a mystery, but Luther talked about how just, like Christ has two natures, the Christian has two natures. Right. And that's kind of where we are until Christ comes back. And we're totally new creation and no old man at all. And see, now with 1517, um, it's interesting because you get the sense that it's all or nothing. It's like they're either talking, they're either saying like, oh, the new man is this, you know, you don't have a law. Or then the old man, you're all old man. You know, it's like they, they don't have this idea that we're like Luther said, we're partially old man we're partially new man right. and they don't have room for that. So like picture, like you have a circle here and it's cut in half and your old man and your new man. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that the new man is supposed to increasingly crowd out the old man Yeah. and you will never completely in this life, you will never completely eliminate that old man. Right. And that old man is actually why you die yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you're a sin, because you always remain a sinner. Sure. Um, but you know, the person who is like this, yeah, that person is not going to have less awareness of their sin. Their sins that they do have are going to bother them more and more. Right. And they're going to be trying to get rid of those sins. Yeah. So people are worried about pride and everything. It's like, no, you're always going to have sin. But you just kind of recognize, like, um, you know, if you're really maturing, that's what it's going to be like. You're going to be recognizing that sin more and more mm-hmm. and not excusing it at all. Right. I mean, right. you're going to be like, hey, you know, wound me friend yeah. <laughs> don't multiply kisses wound me <laughs> right Matt, can i just say a, yeah um i go ahead and talk if you want but i just wanted to talk about a couple more things in colt's article okay uh, before we close that one out all right do you want me to do that right now yeah please do okay so he says trust hope and love are often commanded this is like the third to last paragraph okay, okay. at the end of it trust hope and love are often commanded in scripture but it is impossible for human creatures to obey the command from within. These vital characteristics of being human are created by another, not manufactured by oneself. No one can muster obedience to these commands. The object of our hope, love, and trust must create these in us. But I want to say this. And Christians 
will then experience them within us. <laughs> and mm. when we don't feel that we do, you know, we should say something like, I hope, Lord, help my lack of hope. Sure. <laughs> you know, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. And I, I was talking with a, another friend about this, Dr. Eric Phillips, mm -hmm. and he was commenting on this passage from Kolb, and he said, hope in the Lord rightly understood is not a command to manufacture hope somehow within your heart, but rather to remember God's promises and mm -hmm. take your anxieties to him in prayer. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like I, I kind of understand what maybe Kolb is trying to do here. He's always wanting to emphasize that we don't have the power within. And that's what Luther was all about with Erasmus, right? Mm -hmm. in, in that whole issue of justification. Right. But now we're talking sanctification. Yep. And now we're talking about how, you know, if like this is when you did your critique of uh, Donovan Riley. Mm -hmm. You're just like, Pastor Riley, I know you want to do these. You're, you're like, I think he does want to do these things, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course he does. But he's, he does do but these he's things. denying it, right? He's right. just not living right. with the truth. Uh, yep. Finally, last thing about Kolb's article, I just wanted to say, I think the last paragraph is really good. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you mind if I read that? And yeah, no, go just, ahead. Absolutely. He says, now more than ever, imperatives are needed by people in our God-forsaking society. But God's imperatives attain power to accomplish what he wants. Obedience out of fear, love, and trust of him above all else, only in the context and on the basis of the gift of righteousness through the forgiveness of sins and restoration of our identity as God's children, wrought by the crucified and risen Jesus the Messiah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that he just acknowledges the need that we do have for the law these days mm -hmm. in society, and yeah. you know, of course, in the churches too. I mean, we really need to be talking about the things that are going on. As much as we might not want to do it, we need to make sure we're addressing what's going on in the culture right now. Sure, because those currents uh, are very strong. Yeah, and very persuasive in the sense well coercive you might say right yep. where people are feeling pressure people are feeling pressure from their neighbors and their jobs and we have to stand with them and we have to assure them that no this is wrong and like no and, if, yep. and stand strong and, and i'll stand with you sure and uh so we're entering into really challenging times and yep. uh, we need more of god's law and more of god's gospel all the time don't yeah. we yeah, for sure. Well, and um, you know, a couple a couple of things on that is, you know, that that last paragraph is is helpful because again, I would say so right. So as when we're not justified for Christ's sake, then you're right. We can't conjure faith, hope and love within ourselves. It's impossible. But with Christ, right, right with God all things are possible. Then when we have the gospel, when we are justified in our sanctification in a sense we do conjure those things. We that is part of who we are now. We we um, we don't bring we don't we're not the ones who bring about that thing. We're not the foundation of it, but those grow right. out of the foundation. See, he so again, right? Well, and and again, not that Kolb is is wrong in that when he's talking about that in that paragraph, but again, it's confusing. What's he talking about? Is he talking about justification or sanctification? You know. Uh, um, well, this is the thing. I mean, like they, they talk about the simul, the simul, right? That, you know, I've heard Pastor Riley, especially Donovan Riley, talk about the simul. I right. mean, saint and sinner at the same time. Yeah. But their simul is very flat because they're only understanding the simul in terms of uh, the doctrine of justification. Yep. Where it's either it's a binary zero or a one. Yeah. And that's why Kolb's article, I think, is kind of like the way it is, is mm -hmm. because you know he's trying. But we have this problem with just addressing Christians as Christians. Yep. As the concrete Christian has an old man and a new man, mm -hmm. and we are always going to need that binary one zero message mm -hmm. of old man, new man when it comes to justification, because our old man's always got to completely die, and Christ is going to raise us up again in justification. Um, but then we also have this element where we have to we have to consider it as like the partial, like where you got half half old man, half new man, or, or, you know, maybe you're more over here. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, and like, as long as you have that new man, you have faith, right? You're, no. As long as you have that new man, you're fighting, you're fighting against that old man, right? But that old man is getting pushed out right. and, uh, with the help of, I mean, the word and the sacraments and God's Holy spirit. Like Luther said, we drive out the Jebusites like Joshua did. Yeah. Uh, and that's like, 
that's kind of complicated. I mean, that, that takes on all kinds of different forms and how that, how that takes place in each and every human being. Uh, you know, some of us, it's going to maybe be a little bit different. We're going to be thinking about it differently because of the experiences that we've had in our lives mm -hmm. and the way that maybe people hurt us and oppressed us and, and damaged us. Right. Um, but then others are going to be thinking about it a little. I mean, we, we're going to have this baseline, mm -hmm. but it's going to be when you're talking about the details, that's why you need a pastor. That's yep. why you need a pastor who can help you and who knows you and who loves you and who forgive you and who guide you and shepherd you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, just one more thing on that. I wanted to look at. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, I'm looking. I'm looking. Da, 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 trust, love, and scripture is impossible for human creatures to obey the command from within. Okay. So again, so I, I love the word discipline, discipline and strive. I like those words to obey the commands of Holy scripture. You have a, you have a father in heaven, right? Exactly. All right. <laughs> so, so when I, when I hear language that, that contradicts that, then I'm going, uh, yeah, no, uh, -uh. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let, I'm not, I, I don't hear that very well. Okay. But yeah, I think we've got that covered. Um, the, the one thing I did want to say about God's law with with our culture, I have found I have found it very helpful to use first use with my unbelieving friends and talk to them. I mean, talk to them in very stark terms. Uh, if you've got children, listen to this. Um, I'm giving you a few seconds here to pause the video because I'm going to talk about some crude things, especially concerning the sixth commandment. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> when you talk about homosexuality, we're not talking about that's that's a euphemism. Homosexuality is sodomy. When you think about that act, how are you going to tell me that it's loving for you you're going to tell me you love this man and then you're going to sodomize him? That's what <laughs> that's what we're talking about here. You're going to tell me you love your child but you're going to pump him full of of uh, cross sex hormones. You're going to tell me that you're trying to take care of yourself, but you're going to have a part of your body, a healthy part of your body, amputated from you because of a mental disorder you suffer from. Okay, now this is this is when I talk to, again, um, with individuals who suffer from these sins, I'm a little more delicate, but when I'm debating this with, with my unbelieving friends, and they say, well, what's wrong with, you know, with two men loving each other? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. <laughs> um, let me just lay it out for you here. What's wrong with, you know, a man who wants to be a woman? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with it. I mean, and there's all these horror stories out there. And that I think that's what's really getting at the, the unbelievers in our culture is, the you know, these horror stories of especially women who've tried to become men and have those surgeries done. There's just all kinds of horrific things that go on physically, physiologically with these surgeries. Um, and, there, and the, you know, the, the anecdotes are, are broad, but I think, I think the broad data is out there too, you know. For these things, so so uh, preaching God's law in our culture is something that we shouldn't be afraid to engage in, and engage in it in matter of fact ways, <laughs> because I think we euphemize so much of this. You know, we talk about uh, you know uh, biological you know, or uh, you know trans women. Well, those are men who are deluded to the point where they think they're women. Let's stop using the euphemism. It's not it's not helpful, and especially not that. And that's the thing is that. I mean, because I this is the mind I used to think with. Because when I was out at Claremont, I, you know, a good majority of my friends were engaged in homosexual practice and sodomy, mm -hmm. and you know, I I just euphemized that. It was just kind of this, oh, you know, two men love each other, and that's so wonderful. You know, I never really thought about what that actually means in the bedroom. You know, what and why my friend would uh, would miss a lot of class because he had a, a sexual encounter the night before and he was sick the next day. Okay. Um, you know, this is stuff that, that slowly started to enter, enter my consciousness, but preaching God's law in a matter of fact way helps these people to, to, in, in a first use, first use way, fear the punishment of sin, because that's, that's really what it is. There are natural consequences to sin, to every kind of sin. And we can talk about that in very practical ways. Um, right. you know, one thing, you know, for, as far as homosexuality and transgenderism goes, when I get in, and I know we're kind of going in the weeds on this, but. Um, but Kolb talks about it, talks about how our culture needs God's law. Um, 
you know, especially male homosexuality is more, in my estimation, is more a violation of the fifth commandment than it is the sixth. Now, of course, it is a violation of the sixth commandment. But at the same time, think about how violent that act is. You know, that, that is not doing a loving act to somebody you claim you love. Um, you know, that's not how the Bible defines love. Um, and so, you, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's important that we, that we do bring out those things. Um, but you probably won't hear, you won't, probably won't see a 1517 uh, legacy conference on, you know, the dangers of homosexuality and, you know, the L LGBT, you know, movement. You're not going to see a conference come up on that anytime soon, I doubt. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get too hard on. I don't want to get too hard about that. I mean, it's like, I man. I have yeah. to confess. I mean, I'm attracted to the idea of 1517. I like the <laughs> idea of existing, basically, to proclaim the free gospel to everybody. Sure. I, mean, I love. I love that, and I think that that as we become stronger in faith too, I think that we. That's what we desire. Ultimately, we mm -hmm. desire to pronounce absolution on everybody. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it, it, obviously, some people are not ready to hear it. I mean, yeah. and that's exactly what you're talking about right now is you're, you know, talking about this first use of the law stuff, showing how mm -hmm. what God commands is in conformity with reality. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the way that he created the world uh, to be. And if we're going to go against the grain, uh, it's not going to go well for us. I mean, the most honest sociological research that's out there is going to verify everything that you say. Yep. The, the people who are most honest about their personal experiences um, and what they, what their lives of their, uh, their lives of sin are like, are going to be able to admit that too. I mean, I'm really interested. Um, a lot of people who follow me on Twitter know that, you know, I'm pretty interested in the uh, provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos. Sure. And, Milo is uh, just a character beyond characters, and, and he's pretty obnoxious with his language yep. and the kinds of ways that he'll, you know, tear down people and everything. Um, and yet, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a grain of faith there. And I mean, we is, it, like, especially like in the last year, you know, he's basically like, I, I've left sodomy behind. Yeah, yeah. And he's done it, you know, and he's been taught, and he's always been very honest. Sure. About the fact that that life is yep. not a good lifestyle. Yeah. For really, for anybody yep. at all. I mean, and that it's very damaging to people, and that it's damaged people who often get involved in it. Right. And right. so, I mean, we can't shy away from being honest about all this stuff. Right. And that's right. one of the reasons why I appreciate, you know, someone like Milo. I, it's like, you know, that's definitely not for everybody. It's not for me, and it shouldn't be for most of us. I think to right. be as like a bombastic, per I mean, sure. we do live in a time where uh, it's like to get people to wake up, to get people's attention. People feel like they need to do extreme things. Yep. And um, I don't think the church generally uh, is to be like that. I mean, especially it's pastors. I don't right. think so. Right. But we do need to be able to just very simply and humbly speak the truth and to use hard language and convicting language, too, when we talk about the law of God. Right. Right. Well, I agree. And that's something I mean, that's something I see personally as, you know, one of my one of my roles as a lay person is, you know, I I don't you know, my pastor's too busy tending the sheep of his church to, to get involved in culture wars. You know, that's something I can do. I can do that in my spare time. You know, that's that's something I think we, we should all in some some way, shape, manner or form get involved in. But, you know, um, the the pastor can teach us about those things and then we carry it out into the culture and we, we live by example out in the culture, I think is, is the idea there. And so, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's my place out there, your place to, to, to talk about these things with our friends. So anyway, Hey, um, I'm come, we're coming up on me taking up two hours of your time. You want to, you want to get out of here? You want to try to jump on this oh, other we, article real quick? I thought we had 15 minutes. Left. You got 15 minutes. Let's take a look at this thing real quick. Well, you we want to, should we just try to, I don't know if you've got some quotes pulled or you want to just kind of summarize it or read the whole thing. Well, it's, let if me, you, uh, if, you, if you read the whole thing, that would probably allow us about seven minutes to talk about it. Yeah. Let me see if I can get to it here. Come on now. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can pull it up here. That damned woman. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Hmm. Hang on a second. I'm going to have to. For some reason that's not 
There we go. Now we can do this. Do you want me to read it? I got it. I got it. I okay. got it. Um, all right. So basically this article by Cindy Kosh, I think is how you pronounce her name. Coke, Coke or Kosh. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, this this article talks about Eve, and she started. The, I'll just read the opening paragraph, and then we can just maybe summarize it. Um, wow, we are disgusted by that woman in the garden. Can you imagine what life would be like without her selfish decisions? Is it possible that our world would be untainted by sin? That there would be no death or disease. That woman and man would be perfectly joined. That eternity would be reality right now. We pity that woman and her twisted thoughts. We are ashamed of that miserable woman when she reaches for her desire. Um, I pretty much disagree with that entire paragraph. I'm not disgusted by Eve. Um, I don't know who she, who she thinks her audience is. Um, if she thinks her audience is me, she's barking up the wrong tree because yeah. um, I don't, I'm not disgusted by Eve any more than I'm disgusted by you, Nathan. Um, mm -hmm. As a, yeah, as, me a, too. as a fellow sinner, um, you know, I like I, women. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, so so the opening paragraph is is off putting for sure. Um, and, and again, even her 1517 legacy audience is probably going, nah, I'm not sure I'm identifying with this because, again, they all they all oh, we're great sinners, you know, and that's all we ever are. And, you know, so I don't have a problem with Eve. Uh, but, but her audience, uh, she might have in, this is the, how I took it. And again, th I'm speculating. I can't prove this. Um, the way I took that was her audience was, was, was a caricature of you and I, of us legalists who, uh, are, you know, who think they, she thinks somehow that we think that Eve could have hung in there, you know, that she could have, could have not you know, could have avoided the sin or, or whatever else. Um, well, yeah, I, Matthew. Yeah, go ahead. You know, let me, let me just, let me just read a little bit more because I had pulled some quotes from here that will address what you're talking about right now. Okay, it's a sure. little bit longer, quote, but I think it's important. She says, we can't begin to imagine how the man and the woman did not really understand these words. Like, you know, I guess uh, the words about, uh, well, maybe you can find that in the article right now and verify for me. Yeah. I think it's the word, you will surely die. Um, they had nothing to compare it to. Mm -hmm. There was no other time in history where God's creatures had an opportunity to consider the works of their hands as good or evil. There were no previous moral dilemmas where right or and wrong were a question. They had no great mentor to show them the way. They had no messed up family member to learn from their mistakes. They had creation. They had his word. They had all the gifts of God. They had each other. They had their self, the likeness of their creator. Man and women had everything. I agree with all that. But now she says this. But knowledge of this was impossible. How do you grasp the wholeness of who you are until you discover what is lacking? Mm -hmm. How do you yearn and appreciate right when you have never been without? How do you thank and praise the one who is everything through everything when you didn't know otherwise? She says, we look back upon our poor sister in the garden with contempt, as you're saying, Matt, as if she knew exactly what she was doing. We bash our heads against the wall when we hear that terrible story over and over. Okay, well, I mean, let's just be matter of fact about this. Adam and Eve fell for whatever reason. But the point is that, you know, God gave them these commands to follow. And I don't think we're served when people are, you know, when you say, but knowledge of this was impossible, how do you grasp the wholeness of who you are until you discover that that is lacking mm -hmm. to me this sounds like it's uh the yin yang you know that uh, chinese symbol mm -hmm. the black and the white with the black area with the white spot and the mm -hmm. white spot or the white area with the black spot you know what i'm saying yep um this is like yin yang lutheranism mm -hmm. because like we don't need to be speculating like this we don't need to be thinking like this i mean do you say to a virgin that you don't really grasp the wholeness of who you are until you've been defiled no, I mean, you would never say anything like that. And so just this whole frame, this whole way of looking at everything, in my view, I don't know where it comes from, mm -hmm. um, but I, I suspect it has to do with the whole, you know, taking the bondage of the will too far. Mm -hmm. You know, this whole idea that, 
God is just in charge of everything and God is in charge of us sinning. And I, I mean, is basically, you know, kind of what it, I know they're not saying that. Okay. Right. But it's just like, why, but why talk like this? Yeah. Why talk like this? I don't see how it's helpful yeah. um, at all to any degree. No. Because God, I mean, Adam and Eve, like I said earlier, they, they could, they could understand that. Why would we assume that they couldn't understand enough what their Lord, uh, what their father had commanded? Right. Well, and and again, we we're we're not given to understand whether you know exactly the the details on was it God's plan for for sin for Eve to sin. Well, the best we can say about it is maybe what Joseph said. What what she meant for evil, God meant for good. All right. Well, right. Ex- exactly. But I mean, my whole point would be like you read Genesis one through three. Mm-hmm. Are you given the impression that this was not some great tragedy? No, I think. You read that and you're just like, man, everything, you know, they did everything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's, and I think that's, that's the impression that any reader, and I, I've been teaching students for years and we do this beginning, you know, beginning Christianity class and they read the book of Genesis mm-hmm. and we talk about Genesis one through three quite a bit. And I've had, you know, hundreds, if almost a thousand students. And I mean, that's just kind of the general impression is that like, oh yeah, you know, they messed up. This is a tragedy Mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. And that's the, that is definitely what the text leaves you with. And that's the way, that's the way Luther looked at it too, really. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and, and no less a tragedy is every, you know, every sin we commit now are the, you know, are there degrees of sin? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, but, but, it, but again, my, my problem with the, with the kind of the general theme of this is the same problem you have is that, uh, is this idea. And again, we can't get outside of this. That part I agree with. We, the, in a lot of ways, the way we understand good is, is juxtaposed to evil. Now, while that's, that's in some ways the way we understand good or the way we experience good, that does not mean that I have to go out and have an affair to understand the goodness of being faithful or be, having fidelity to my spouse. I don't, you know, this this is Chad Bird's kind of talk where he talks about you really can't understand grace until you go out and sin a whole bunch, right? That's well, I the, would, yeah. I would push back on you here a little bit too and I would say that in our experience as fallen creatures, definitely one of the ways that we understand what good is right. is by, by its opposite. Yeah. But I would not I would not go so far as to say that that's the only way that yeah. we can understand what good is, even as fallen creatures who are now redeemed in Christ, especially. Right. 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 So yeah, the whole thing just doesn't sit well with me because I'm like, look, I mean, again, you're superimposing something on yeah. the text. Yeah. That's yeah. not there. Yeah, 100 percent. Well, and, and, and I would take that friendly amendment to, to my comments to say that no, you don't have to. You don't have to be the prodigal son to figure out that God is is gracious. You're you're prodigal enough the way you are. Okay, that's for one thing, and 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 the second thing is is we can you know, that's part of being a redeemed, you know, child of God is that we understand His word is good. We don't have to go out and experience the opposite of His word to figure out. Oh, yeah, what God? You know, that's what the world does. I mean. I did a podcast, I don't know, a number of years ago on these two evolutionary biologists who came on Joe Rogan's podcast who talked about how, you know what, what we're figuring out in evolutionary uh, biology and behavior is that the best situation for a man and a woman is to be in a committed relationship, monogamous relationship that bears children. And I'm like, good job. It only took you, you know, however long, you know, evolutionary biology has been. It only took you that long to figure out that the sixth commandment actually applies. We figured That's that the out. Einstein's, I think, yeah. Yeah, we we, you know, we figured this out four or five thousand years ago when God, you know, uh, gave us the, these commands. So, um, well, this, well, this is the thing. I mean, it's like, and that is the key thing I think that we should be focusing on and yeah. kind of to bring everything to a uh, to tie a nice bow on everything we've been talking to. Mm-hmm. It's like God is good. He's our father and it's good to obey his commandments. Yep. <laughs> and it's like, yes, we all like to have things explained to us a little bit every now and then. Like, well, why are you, you know, why, why do I have to do this? Or what, why do you want me to do this? Yep. But, but generally, but generally speaking, no, he's good. Yep. Obey him. Yep. And, that, well, and that's all, and that's all you needed. That's yep. all you needed, Eve. That's all you needed, Adam. Yep. You know, I, Luther, Luther was funny because Luther said that like, if Adam had been standing next to Eve in the garden 
he would have said, "Shut up, serpent!" <laughs> so, should have, yeah. So I guess L- Luther Luther thinks that you know Adam would have uh, taken the snake down if he'd yeah. been right there. <laughs> yeah, hard. Yeah, hard I to say. I, I don't. I don't want. I don't want to go there. But, yeah. But well. I, uh, I, yeah. So. Yeah, and th- and that's the thing. I, I this is one thing I emphasize to the to the teens at my church is, hey, at the end of the day. The reason we believe things is, and they all they all say in chorus, almost like I'm catechizing them, which I am, uh, because God said so. Um, you don't have to understand everything that's contained in Holy Scripture, but if God says it, you believe it and obey it. That's it. You don't, and, and you chalk up your misunderstanding to your own problems and not to problems with God. See, that's what the, the world does the opposite. They, uh, they don't understand something in Holy Scripture, and they chalk it up to a character flaw with God. You know, go ahead. Well, this is just what Luther was saying, again, in the bondage of the will. That's mm-hmm. his whole point, is that, like, you, you're not going to always understand things, um, and the problem is with us. So, I mean, like, if we don't understand something, if we doubt something, if yep. it just seems wrong to us, we're just like God. I confess, you, yeah. you know, you you know, you know better. And I mean, it's like I understand we live in this modern world with all the science and technology, and you know, people telling mm-hmm. us that we're wrong and everything. But we need to just basically say, "Get behind me, Satan!" And right. we need to trust in in the Lord. He's he's given us more proof right. than anybody yeah. in this world could ever offer us. Yeah, you know, 100%. His, his death and resurrection and everything that he did in the Old Testament and the New Testament and you know, the rocks cry out, archaeology can help. I mean, it's like all the, if, you, if you're struggling with that, that's all there too. I mean, God has given us proof. I mean, that's oh, yeah. what it says in Acts 17, Acts 17, 30 and 31. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and St. Paul's clear about this as well. And Romans 1 that, you know, in, in the truest sense of the word, there really are no pure unbelievers. The, the unbelievers have just right. so far suppressed the truth that you know that they've deluded themselves into believing there's not a god now um you know a couple of practicals that that i would offer on this is um so when i'm when i'm talking to my unbelieving friends you know um i say okay let's just say for the sake of argument that that god exists how irrational would it be for me to not believe what god says so i take two premises god exists and he speaks to us through the bible if i believe those two things how irrational would I be to not believe and obey what God says? That would be completely irrational, right? Now, of course, I, I get you don't believe that God exists or he speaks to the Bible. But if you believe those two things, then I would be stupid not to obey. All right, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, is if I am not going to be, if I'm not going to submit myself to God and believe in him, then who am I going to submit myself to? You're going to submit yourself to somebody. Am I going to submit myself to you, Nathan? Are you going to be the one who commands my life and guides my life? Mm. I I'm going to take a pat. I'm going to take a hard pass on that. Okay. Um, that would see. That was one of the big things that God, the I believe the Holy Spirit used to draw me back to the church because the the I remember the day it happened. I sat. I was in downtown L.A. and I grabbed a copy of Dawkins' God Delusion. And started reading it. And that's when it dawned on me. Oh, wait a second. Um, what Dawkins is trying to do here is not get me to not believe in God. He wants me to adopt him as a, as my God. Or science. That's what's going on here. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I think that's a really bad idea. And I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. So here's my options. I either believe in God and submit to him. Or I believe in Dawkins and science or whatever else and submit to them. And I'm like, okay, that, I mean, I think it's a binary choice. It's, a, you know, there's no real middle ground there. Um, and so I'm like, well, I don't want to submit to Dawkins in science because men are flawed. And that's, that's, that's proven to be a problem when, when you get that kind of, put that kind of authority in a man's hands. And so I better get this God thing figured out. And so that, that, that was a long journey, but yeah, it, yeah. At any rate, um, that's that's what I try to tell the kids is, look, there will come a day when um, when uh, you don't understand something about Christianity or when you start doubting something about our faith and that sort of thing, and you're going to have to just say, you know what, I'm going to believe and not doubt. That's just what I'm going to do. And um, there will come a time when you're reading your Bible 
where you say, I don't understand this, or somebody challenges you about the Bible, and you say, well, that sounds like a really good challenge to the Bible. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, you're just going to have to say, well, it's a problem with my misunderstanding, and I'm going to believe what God says. And right. now, that, do that doesn't mean that you can't check out the apologetics. Um, no, no. You, I, mean, I, give, I, give them, I give them as much apologetics as I possibly can, but at the end of the yeah. day, what I say is you as a Christian have to be willing to say, you know, my unbelieving friends will challenge me, well, why do you believe that? And I say, because God said so. They're like, well, that's stupid. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to believe? What you say? Again, if I believe there's a God, who should I trust more, him or you? That's really my options, okay? So, you know, don't give me, don't give me this nonsense of, oh, well, that's just silly to just put blindly put your faith in in God. Well, this it's stupid. Huh? This is Garnett's wager. You know, yeah. Like well, 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 in a sense, Garnett's yeah. Wager. In a sense, it is because, well, well, it, it is Pascal's wager in a sense, but it's not. In, in this sense that that I've seen what happens when men put when people put their complete faith and trust in men or when men wrest authority from people that's when you get Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot and Hitler that's what that's where that goes all right so I know my history well enough to know when you remove God from the equation and he's no longer the supreme authority and the leader is what you get you get death, destruction, and misery, you know, to the, to the, and that's all you get. So, I, you know, I'm not down for that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not down for that. So, um, so at any rate, um, uh, yeah, I, th yeah, the, the thing that, that put me off about Cindy's piece here was, was again, I, you know, felt like she was really trying to, you know, we, we've got to, ex you know, we've got to experience the bad in order to understand the good. Well, it, right. No, Eve did not. She understand the good. She understood the good. She understood God's word was good. Um, without, without understanding what evil was. Um, she, yep. she, yeah. And we can right. do this and we can do the same thing as Christians. So yeah, the, I, that, Amen. Uh, that whole thing. So anyway, let me let you go. I think I've got enough here for a couple of good podcasts. I'll get, uh, I'll get our producer on this producer, Isaac, on this and uh, get him cracking on this and we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, yeah, keep your, uh, keep your eyes. I don't, I, I don't follow 1517 stuff enough anymore. So keep your, I'll try to keep my eyes open a little bit better. Um, but uh, with, with some of this stuff, but come up with something else and we'll uh, let's not make the gaps between when we do podcast because you're definitely, everybody's, you know, wanting you to come on is like, you know, every time I say, uh, blah, 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 like, what's his name? I was like, Hey, did you have Rennie on this week? And I'm like, no. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you're, you're very popular. We get a lot of, sure. we get, we get a lot of hits on this. Sure. So. <laughs> anyway. All right. Hey, All right. great talking with you, Matt. Have yeah. A great weekend. Okay. You too, hey, buddy. Thanks so much. Okay. Right. Take care. <laughs>